Welcome back everyone. Sura 17 has drawn quite a bit of attention over the years due to some apparent problems. Let's begin with a quick overview of the first several verses. As the current text stands, verse 1 begins by describing the night journey of an unnamed messenger. Of course, Islamic tradition has filled in numerous gaps with extraordinary details about Muhammad and his flying donkey. Verse 2 switches topics drastically to Moses and Israel. Verse 3 digresses to Noah, then verses 4 through 8 resume the discussion of Israel and appear to speak directly about the destruction of the second temple by the Romans called God's servants in verse 7b. When the second promise came to pass, we raised up against you, servants of ours, to cause you distress and to enter the temple as they entered it the first time and to destroy completely what they had conquered. Some oddities about verse 1 are immediately apparent. For example, it would have made much more sense to say something about Israel's exodus from Egypt flowing more naturally into verse 2, which of course talks about Moses and the book for Israel. In his article on Muhammad's night journey, Daniel Beck gives us several more problems to consider. The current text of Surah 17.1 breaks the Surah's otherwise consistent rhyme. The verse has a different theme than the immediate context. The Quran's servant did not work miracles. Of course, the Quran repeatedly refuses to associate its messenger with the miraculous. Later Muslims seem to have realized that this makes Muhammad appear inferior, and so they fixed that problem with numerous legends about the miraculous Muhammad. And finally, Surah 17.1 has an odd shift in narrative perspective. I encourage you to read Beck's article for a much more thorough description of these problems, which have, for some time now, compelled scholars to suggest that there's later redactional activity in Surah 17. A problem that's especially important for us to note is the rather awkward place this passage puts the Quranic believers and their prophet. Beck puts it this way. The original text of Surah 17, 1-8 characterized Christian mastery of Jerusalem as the decreed culmination of biblical precedent. A perfect prophet, referring to Jesus, had entered Jerusalem and his followers had, at God's command and as decreed by the book of Moses itself, expelled the Jews and destroyed their temple. These followers and their Christian faith had a superior claim to the holy city, as the original text of Surah 17, 1-8 confirmed. Given this Quranic endorsement, how could the believers claim supremacy over Christian Jerusalem or seek to rebuild its ruined masjid? God's new servants had built their shrines to the west of the temple ruins, symbolizing God's new covenant, a purified city now tied to the physical places of Christ's death and resurrection. And how could the believers claim their prophet was the final prophet, who the people of the book were obliged to heed? At best, he was a second Moses, lesser than Isa, the Messiah of the Quran, just as Jews were lesser than Christians, and likewise denied a legitimate claim to the holy city. So setting aside the current text of Surah 17.1, it's easy to see the problems these verses would present for the Quranic believers. In some significant ways, there's very little room for them left, and of course, little room left for their plain warner. Beck's article gives us a couple possible solutions. Logically, there were two ways to insulate the emerging Islamic faith from such searing critique. First, Muhammad must have indeed reached Jerusalem and fulfilled his prophetic destiny in the holy city, making him equal to Jesus. Second, Muhammad never failed to reach Jerusalem because he had never tried to reach Jerusalem. Instead, he lived and died almost entirely within the Hejaz, focusing his pilgrimage entirely on the competing Arabian shrine of Mecca, with his followers early Jerusalem Qibla being an abrogated aberration. Obviously, Islamic tradition went for the second option. Muhammad lived and died in the Hejaz. However, the Quran's interpolator in 17.1 went for the first option, that the Quran's messenger did reach Jerusalem, though in a mysterious, secret, unfalsifiable way, a night journey. And so this hypothetical Quran redactor just made up this night journey out of thin air? Well, no, actually, there's ample material to draw from in the history of Christian pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Beck gives us this striking example from a 5th century monk called Peter the Iberian, one of many anti-Chalcedonians prevented from traveling to Jerusalem for pilgrimage. So how did Peter the Iberian perform a pilgrimage when he wasn't allowed to perform a physical pilgrimage? You probably guessed the answer. He made a spiritual journey by night. His follower and biographer John Rufus gives us this account. 
After these things, when the time after summer arrived, the Blessed One returned to the brethren in the plain. When he went, some were indignant in their soul and said, How, when he abode all these days beside Jerusalem, did the Blessed One not desire greatly to enter the holy city, even if by night, and venerate the worshipful places, and especially the holy Golgotha and the life-giving tomb? The day after his departure, one of the brethren, who was very simple and innocent, came to them and said, I saw a fearful vision this night. For it seemed to me that I was seeing Abba Peter, the bishop, who was saying to me, Can you give me a hand, brother? When he alone took me in this vision to the holy city in the same night in which he was about to depart. Now what follows is a lengthy list of all of the holy sites that were visited. You can pause the video and read them if you want. This spiritual night journey was a creative way to overcome obstacles that prevented one from making a more traditional pilgrimage. The idea of spiritual pilgrimage, according to Beck, was adapted by the Quranic interpolator in Surah 17.1. Peter's spiritual pilgrimage to Jerusalem is probably the most prominent example of late 5th, early 6th century narratives in which anti-Chalcedonian believers used such ritual innovation to justify their abandonment of the Palestinian holy places. It is this abstracted and spiritualized idea of pilgrimage that Surah 17.1 uses to connect its own servant of God with the holy places of Jerusalem, claiming their authority for the Arabian prophet. This is not to suggest that Surah 17.1 passively copied such anti-Chalcedonian precedent or viewed it as authoritative. Rather, the author of this Quranic text cleverly and creatively adapted the idea of spiritual pilgrimage. So what then are the signs that are shown in this spiritual journey in Surah 17.1? According to Beck, the signs intend to signify something that is theologically equivalent to whatever was seen on the Christian pilgrimage. There are different approaches to reading the Quran. Some will fill in the Quran's many gaps by assuming the reliability of Islamic tradition. Others look at those traditions a little more skeptically, and still others are persuaded that the Quran is best understood outside of Islamic tradition. Beck's thesis in this video is obviously one example of the latter, and many will have to admit it's at least as plausible as a traditional interpretation which finds no real support in the Quran at all. Muhammad's night journey on a flying donkey. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.